my name's Justin. Uh, I'm a part of the uh, Violence, Abuse and Mental Health League team and um, uh, and yeah, I guess I, I'm also a professional as well in, in that I um, work for the Alliance of Sport. I'm Sean Oram. I'm an applied health researcher based at King's College London. I'm with the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience there. And I'm the director of the Violence, Abuse and Mental Health Network. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's very interesting, actually, that you asked that, because I guess when it comes to, I felt there was a movement prior to lockdown, if you will, where things were becoming more visible. People were able to to respond or, or you know, things with services were identifiable around them so they could reach them, whether that be through safe measures, you know, um, websites, etc. And there was a lot of visibility starting to appear. It felt that way anyway. Um, but obviously, when, when lockdown happened, I think there was a lot of mixed messages sent through as to, restrictions and things like this and, and lack of movement and whatnot so i think at the beginning of lockdown the mixed messages made i think a quite a profound impact initially where you know people were it almost sent a message to those that potentially were causing harm if you will that, that there's this restrictive thing around people now that they can operate in does that make sense hidden rather than the, these things be visible you know these invisible things probably became more intense yeah and i think if i could add to that i think as well as that early use of the social restrictions by abusers to limit further the ability of victims to leave their houses there was all there's also been and there's continuing to be the problem that people who are experiencing abuse don't have that access to the physical spaces including um, schools in the early part of the, the pandemic um, and at intervals throughout and workplaces still for some people that had previously perhaps offered them a place of respite um, from the abuse or a place from which they could access support um, and there's also been the problem that you know although specialist violence and abuse services they've adapted incredibly well I think to providing support on a rem remote basis whether that's through text messaging or online online chat functions they've been very badly affected by financial stresses as a result of the pandemic so this, the sector's really been um, you know quite quite badly affected um, by by COVID-19 also and I think one of the things that we've also seen coming through is that people who have experienced violence and abuse but are now in a place of um, physical safety and have perhaps been feeling more in a place of emotional safety as well have found the fact of of the social restrictions and the isolation really quite re-traumatizing um, and it has taken them back to quite a bad place so I think for you know across a range of um, uh, people in different types of experiences and also different types of services I think there's been some really um, severe impacts of the pandemic. That's a good point as well isn't it I think those that are recovering as well still or you know recovery or coping with if you will is that's a tough ask as well when people are you're not allowed to do things, you know, you're kind of out and because they're around you, it does stay, stay re Um And when you feel restricted, then all sorts of things, you, you start thinking about all kinds of things and maybe not being able to air that with someone or, or like uh, Sean just said, in a, be in a place of safety where you can reflect on it positively about how strong you are rather than how you're not strong at that point, you know, in, in those sorts of need to all kinds of um, further, right, I guess mental health issues, if you will, and triggers and trauma. I think it, I think it was both, um, but really the, the concern of the research team was that, um, you know, it needed to come up with concrete um recommendations that you know were, were capable of being put into practice that could make a tangible difference um to people who are experiencing abuse and that was really the you know although we've we've done a lot of work to disseminate the findings and as part of that we hope that we will be raising awareness actually part of what we're wanting to raise awareness of is that there are these actions that survivors of abuse feel that would have been helpful for them and so the recommendations really have been survivor generated recommendations reflecting back on these were my experiences. These are the ways in which I feel I could have been identified um, and I could have been supported. Um, and you know, the, the concern of the network very much 
was that we wanted to be doing we wanted to be supporting the, the work that survivors and services wanted. And so that project came out of a call that we put to our members to ask what research they wanted to see happen. Um, and what came through that was that there needed to be a piece of work that was recognising and responding to the enhanced risk that there would be to children and young people who were now locked down at home um, with no access um, to, to schools and, and leisure clubs um, and were potentially not known to statutory services who, who could have that helping role and would give them, you know, if you were known to statutory services, you may qualify for a place as a vulnerable child um, at, um, you know, in um, in schools. But, you know, there was a group of children who were going to miss out on that because they weren't known to services. Yeah, so I mean, from my from from my experience, well, from my lived experience, I guess we're we're heading that way where we're valuing the voice of the of of experts by experience or lived experience. We're actually valuing that properly and and rewarding it in a way that um, I think, Shan, this kind of goes back to where the conversation we've been having lately are around the financial remuneration. But that isn't just about finances; it's about value um, and values and sort of valuing that voice equally to that of the academic or that of the the um, professional, if you will, within the space. So that it becomes more of an equal platform and that you can then start to um, explore and, and not just me but for others and then encourage others into that that kind of fold if you will and, and the way that people are treated then equally offers the opportunity for more people to get involved and feel comfortable enough to step forward and potentially and share their experience because it's different from mine and as everyone else is different from each other's if you will and it's just nice to get that collective voice of um of value or through values that kind of everyone shares really one of the earliest pieces of work we did in the network was um, a, a, a consultation in collaboration with McPin Foundation of people with lived experience of violence, abuse and mental health problems to identify what, you know, what research priorities would be in this space. And that's been a really helpful um, activity for us to have done because it's really informed um, the grant competitions that we've run, so the, the the research that we've looked to fund through the network, but it's also helped us think about what events that you know what events we're running and what research do we want to highlight that we know is of interest to survivors. So really trying to get the the, the voice and priorities of, of survivors throughout um, the network it has been really important to us. I think I think there's always going to be competing priorities um, depending on one's um, experiences or um, occupation or, or where you are in the policy cycle. And I think one of the benefits of being a network is that we have, you know, we, we do have a large and diverse membership that pulls people across multiple categories. And you know, the categories aren't mutually exclusive, but we have, you know, we have people with lived experience, we have people, we have academics, we have practitioners, we have policymakers, multiple people wearing multiple hats. But what they've all got in common is that you know, they have this interest in violence, abuse, and, and mental health. And I think because we are able to pull people together through events and by sharing resources with them electronically well you know and through online events at the moment while we're not able to get together in person we are able to expose people to each other's priorities um, and share kind of information and resources from across those different audiences so i think yeah, I think I think we've had impact in, in in three main ways. So the first, as I said, is is connecting people um, who have these shared interests in our, our experience of, of violence, abuse, and mental health problems, and I think enabling them to to share their expertise, I think, is a really important impact in a, in and of itself, and is something that will continue to bear fruit as we kind of work through the remainder of the network and beyond. I think the second way we achieve impact is through really disseminating the findings of, of research um, but also translating them for the real world so we do very little of our own 
research through the Violence, Abuse and Mental Health Network, we're really more there to, um, to, to facilitate and to amplify what's going on and, and help people make sense of that, whether they're coming from policy or coming from a practice background or, or, or coming at it as a member of the public. And then I think the third thing is um, through funding research that we think will make an important contribution to improving knowledge and, and really driving forward important change in this area. So we do that through our grant competition. So we've funded eight projects so far, which we've, you know, we've been really excited about. And then we'll be awarding a, a further three to five in the next three months. And, and, and again, we think we'll continue to see the impacts of, of what, what those projects are achieving in, in the years to come.